Hey everybody, thanks for watching. I decided to make this video because I really felt that people needed an honest to God review of the new 5th gen Ram 1500s. So that's the 2019 to present. I'm going to talk about a lot of the great things about the truck, some of the bad things, and ultimately why I'm getting rid of it. Now the truck that I'm actually going to be talking about today specifically is a 2001 Ram 1500 Bighorn. It's the 4x4 and it has the 5.7 with the e-torque option. Now that's that electric motor, it's a small little lithium ion battery. All it really does give you the start stop feature and a couple other things, but that's what I got. That's what I'm gonna talk about. I kept it stock for a while, maybe about six months, and then I did some modifications to the suspension. I already have a video out on that actually, uh, about uh, how it handles off-road, but really I'm gonna talk about the entire truck as a whole now. You'll notice that the wheels are actually off at Ram Rebel, one of the 33 inch tire got these side steps from amazon they're only 200 bucks and they've worked out great this has the 4x4 off-road group which came from the factory with the one inch lift hill descent control and a locker also got the sport package as you can see here the two exhaust tips built in the bumper color matched now i don't have a bed liner or the spray liner i was planning to get it just didn't end up happening now of course i don't need it now uh, this is that billet silver look and I actually like the color. Uh, it's pretty nice. The old truck overall is nice. It does have the tow mirrors on it, which you know I haven't really used, but if needed, I've got them. Uh, I found that just in a low down mode, it's, it's more than sufficient for towing a small car. Going inside here, you'll notice that this is not a factory interior. Uh, it actually came from the factory with cloth seats, but I went to Catskin, got these put in, it was probably one of the best mods I did to the truck. Cost me about 1600 bucks. Definitely recommend it. Looking at the entertainment setup here, it's an 8.4 inch screen. Uh, it really does everything that I need to. It's great. So threw the blue knobs on there just to add some color. Got my charger ports. You can fit a bunch of stuff in the center console. But really, the highlight of the interior was the cat skin that I had put in. Uh, I'm a pretty big guy. I'm about 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 depending on what shoes I'm wearing. And I fit in this, obviously, without a problem. In fact, I've got more room than I know what to do with. So the interior space is phenomenal. It's one of the best things about the truck is the interior. Now, to give you a driver's perspective, this is what I'm looking at when I look at the dash. I'm gonna go ahead and just fire it up right now for you. Uh, because it's a big horn, I just have that small sliver of an electronic dash, which if you get the Rebel or something else, the whole thing will be um, digital. But still not a problem. It does what I need it for. Got an extra foam mount, which is probably kind of counterproductive, but oh well. Here's that 8.4 inch screen. Um, you, know, you can see it's got all the basic stuff like your nav, um, does have an app page. You can go and access a bunch of stuff if you're really using them. Uh, one of the best parts about this screen that I like is I can access the backup camera whenever I want. So I use this a lot when I was off-roading or hooking up the trailer. Now it's also got some of the basic stuff like your AC control, right? Every car's got that music, all the standard stuff nowadays. It took me a while to get used to shifting with a knob. You know, this is just the cover that I bought for it. But the knob was definitely weird. It took about a good month or two. You know, looking at this, it's got standard stuff. I'm currently in two-wheel drive, four auto, high, low. It's that clutch dial transfer case. Here's the start-stop button, which I turn off every time I'm in the truck. It's also got that hill descent control and the axle lock because it's got the 4x4 off-road package. Moving on to the center console. It's kind of dirty. Stuck all my junk in there. But just to give you an idea, this is huge. It's about 12 inches deep, so you can fit quite a bit in here. If I lift the top cover, you'll see a small little area, which I just throw some cash, receipts. It's really all you can use it for. But if you lift the entire armrest, you'll see uh, a diagram here that's got some Sakatoa on it, some angles, which really doesn't do anything for you. You're never going to use this off-road. You're not going to hand calculate your angles. But it's cool to know that's there. And then that back area, there's just so much room. Uh, it makes it really easy with two kids. You can see you got the booster seat. Easily reach back there and grab them. But really, it's a good family truck if you're just using it as like a regular commuter and that such. It's got a little space up here to throw my registration, small glove box, and then, of course, the bigger one down below. The overhead controls are pretty basic. You know, every car has got your two lights there, as you can see here. Um, it does have the controls for the back window, as you can see here. And of course, it's got a little spot for my uh, sunglasses. Going to the back seat, you can really see just how much room you got here. 
If I didn't have the kids in and I fold the seat up, I could fit a ton of stuff back here. But what I really want to talk about is this window. Now, these trucks have a serious problem with overhead leaks from the back window and the tail light or the cab light. And it really just does a lot of damage to your car. You know, it comes in right through here. The seals are just bad. If you're in the market for one of these and you do see water stains, have the dealer fix it before you buy it. All right, now taking a look underneath the hood, you're going to see that 5.7 Hemi with the e-torque motor. I'll get to that in a minute. What I really want to talk to you about are some of the critical failure points on these fifth gen trucks. One of the biggest being the exhaust manifolds cracking. While you can reach them, they are a pain to swap out and they're expensive as well. Now the second does of course involve the e-torque motor as well as the control unit that it comes with. When they fail, they are really expensive to replace. And the third underneath the hood is the battery terminal, the positive in particular. They've been arcing, causing a lot of fires, so make sure you're looking out for that. You know, here's the e-torque. It's just belt-driven. It's pretty simple. It helps with your shifts. It helps with your takeoffs. When it works, it's pretty nice. I just hate the starting and stopping. Now, even though this came with a one-inch lift, I wanted it level, so I added some Fox 2.0 coilovers, as well as some zone upper control arms. I like the stiffer ride, and these handled amazing off-road. Uh, just to make sure I was matching front to rear, I did swap out the rear shocks and throw in some Vox 2.0s as well. Now, one of the things I really don't like about this truck is the bed. You know, these are real expensive. You spend a lot of money for a truck. You want it to last. You want it to be durable. The first time I reached over and picked up something heavy, I actually pushed in the entire side of the bed. It, you can see here with my hand. I could make it dent. That's not something that I really wanted for a truck that I was going to use with a truck especially putting heavy things in the bed. And the fact that I can just sit here with my hand and I can push it in really made me feel uneasy. I didn't like that. Now, I use my trucks probably on par with the average person. Maybe it's a little bit more on the truck side than a, a regular car. And by that, I mean, I'll tow a car five, six times a year. And I'll put something heavier than 200 pounds in the bed of the truck, maybe once every two months, right? And I'm frequently moving car parts, axles, stuff like that. So I do use the bed of the truck. Um, with all that said, some of the things I can't just show you walking around the truck, I have to tell you, uh, are the reasons why I am not keeping this thing. Um, one of the biggest ones is its ability to tow. Now, if you look on paper, you'll see that the 1500 can actually tow up to 11,000 pounds, right? Which definitely raises some to my brows. Uh, a lot of folks that had three quarter tons or one tons in the early 2000s or 90s, like myself, that's where I came from, uh, saw that and thought, wow, I could have some comfortability when I'm empty and still be able to tow the trailers. Don't do it. If you have any kind of trailers or you're towing on a regular basis, don't look at those spec sheets and buy a truck like this. I've got the 321 gears, which is a little better for mileage. If you want the higher towing capacity, um, the 11,000 one, you want to get the 392 gears. But really, the only difference is going to be gearing. Now, I have towed about 5,000 pounds. Maybe 5,500 when you add some gear in the back of the truck, stuff like that. And it pushed this truck around like it was a Dodge Dakota. This truck struggled. Had a lot of power, of course, but the trailer just pushed us around. Uh, that was a U-Haul, so it didn't have trailer brakes on it. I actually don't have a trailer brake controller for this, just uh, the package for the mirrors and the look up and everything, or the um, connection. But um, that <laughs> this is actually rated for about 8,000, and I was at 5,500, and I was kind of white knuckling it. You know, before when I had my 05 3,500, it never bothered me. When I was towing a car, especially a race car that I've stripped down, it didn't even feel like I had a trailer on the truck. Uh, it's 100% obvious as you do with this. Like I said, white knuckled the entire four hour trip. So that is a really big downside to this, for me at least, because I do tow on a somewhat regular basis. Um, another big issue, and this is something that'll affect everybody, is, you know, I went from a Cummins turbo diesel. I actually got about 20 miles per gallon. Yes, diesel's more expensive, but it's only about a 20% premium over gasoline, especially 89, which you need for the 5.7 Hemi. And with that said, it is not just a 
increase in fuel economy compared to this 1500. Now the nameplate, again going back to the sticker, says 17 on the freeway and about 22, or excuse me, 17 in the city, 22 on the freeway. I didn't see that when it was stock. And you look on the forms and everyone says, oh, you got to break it in. You got to take it to at least 5,000 miles and then you'll get to have your actual mileage. No. Now, my actual average was about 16 and a half with it 100% stock. As you saw the mods that I did, all I did, because those rims and tires, they just came from a Rebel. The Rebel had the exact same MPG specs as this Bighorn. Uh, so essentially, you can't even count the tires as a modification on this. All I did was level it because this had the off-road groups it already had a one inch lift from the factory still had those specs on it and all i did when i put the coilovers in is i raised the front two more inches so they would be level front to rear and i get about 11. i get the same mileage as my 1996 ram 1500 with a 5.9 magnum got and it's pitiful. Yeah, a lot more power, more capability than that 96. But when you're paying five bucks a gallon and you're only getting 11, and all you did was level the truck, it's pretty disheartening. So that uh, definitely adds up to around $250, $300 a month in fuel uh, for how much I drive on a monthly basis. And while you might think, oh, if you can afford a, a truck like this, gas is no problem, that's not how that works, right? Fuel is a huge factor. Uh, and when you're purchasing a vehicle, especially if you're going to daily drive it. And something that people don't think about when we're talking MPGs is, you got to remember from the factory, when they thought, whatever conditions they had at least, that you were going to get 17 to 22 MPGs, they factor that into your overall range, of course. So when you're looking at a truck like this and you see, oh, I've got 380 miles of range, that's not bad. Well, when the actual MPG hits, a full tank on this truck, this hybrid truck gets me 265 miles, which is BS. That's ridiculous. Uh, it's, that's really painful. So I have to basically fill up when I'm doing a road trip every three and a half hours. I got to fill up. I have hit the gas light on this truck almost every two weeks. And I have never hit a gas light in any other vehicle. So that, that definitely told me something there. Uh, what am I going to do? After getting rid of this, right, what are my options? I'm going back to a 5.9 Cummins. Whether it be a third gen or second gen, I don't care. I'm going back to the truck. Those trucks are pretty much bulletproof. If you get a manual transmission, if you have an automatic, you just got to build it. At least I know that. Um, I'm going to go back to that. It's a lot more affordable. It's more capable. If I scratch it and ding it, who cares? It's an older truck, and it's a third the price. So... Uh, I hope this helped you. If you're on the fence with one of these trucks, please don't let the negative things I just said about it completely turn you away. These are really good trucks, especially if you're not doing any kind of heavy stuff like that, towing a car, putting engine blocks in the back. If you're really just going to Home Depot or different things like that, this is the perfect truck. Or maybe if you're going to tow a car once a year, uh, I would say this is no problem. Just note that obviously it's not going to tow like it's a three quarter or one ton, but hopefully you can keep those things in mind and uh, maybe this helped you. So uh, if you like this video, please, I do appreciate uh, the support. Please hit the subscribe button and uh, hopefully I can give you some more content. So thanks for watching.